We are experiencing increased anxiety and frustration during this pandemic and being in lockdown. I think in a way this time though is a gift to us, a chance to pay attention to things we haven't before. And I think being in the present moment is critical to easing the anxiety. Being in the present moment is what we call mindfulness, and that's the subject of this sermon. I'm sure you've noticed, as I have, the increasing amount of information we are subjected to on a daily basis. And for kids and youth these days, it's even worse because of all the electronic media they engaged with. In 2009, researchers Clifford Nash, Eil Olfer, and Anthony Wagner at Stanford University did a study intending to identify the gift or edge that students who multitask have over those that don't. Many students these days do their homework with their music playing and perhaps they are texting back and forth to a friend on their phone or computer at the same time. They separated a group of 100 students into two groups, one that were heavily multitasking and one that tended to do more or less one thing at a time. They first tested their ability to focus on one set of information when confronted with two sets at the same time. They found that the students students who were used to using several types of media at once couldn't separate out the information they needed to do the task well. So they hypothesized that maybe they have better memories. So then they tested the two groups' ability to remember when a letter appeared multiple times in a sequence of letters. Again, the heavy multitaskers did not do well. Finally, they thought, maybe these multimedia kids were better at switching from one thing to another quickly. The test subjects were shown images of letters and numbers at the same time and instructed what to focus on. When they were told to pay attention to numbers, they had to determine if the digits were even or odd. When told to concentrate on letters, they had to say whether they were vowels or consonants. Again, the heavy multitaskers underperformed the light multitaskers. They couldn't help thinking about the task they weren't doing, Ofer said. The high multitaskers are always drawing from all the information in front of them. They can't keep things separate in their minds. The researchers were astonished at these results. They don't know if the multitasking group were born with an inability to concentrate or if they'd been damaged cognitively from the deluge of electronic media and information they've received. Researcher Wagner said, when we're in a situation where there are multiple sources of information, they're not able to filter out what's not relevant to their current goal. And that failure to filter means they're slowed down by that irrelevant information. So in effect, multitaskers are the worst at multitasking. <laughs> I've noticed that the more details that I've had to pay attention to in my life, the less attentive that I am. This became highlighted for me when it was pointed out to me years ago by my wife, Jennifer, that I was frequently mismatching our socks. We've had, we had many pairs of white, black, and brown socks that have only slight differences like the width of the elastic at top or slight variations in color. But even after it was noted that I had been making those mistakes and I worked really hard to pay attention to the socks, I still would hear Jennifer suddenly laughing in the other room and saying, Frida, have you been matching the socks again? <laughs> I tell you, it's humiliating. <laughs> For a while, I was banned from matching socks at home, which by the way, has its advantages. It takes a lot of time to match socks for five people. I think there's a key to this dilemma in how Jennifer approaches the laundry and in fact many things in her life. Jennifer loves doing laundry. She always has. She approaches it as a work of love. You can see it in the way she picks up each garment that has just come out of the dryer where I tend to see just a basket of clothes that I can fold in short order. She sees something much more pleasurable. Perhaps it is the connection with each of her loved ones that she experiences as she picks up a shirt and carefully folds it. Perhaps it's the joy of doing something well. 
She has a particular way of folding clothes that's a good one, but it is the fullness with which she brings herself to the task that is so apparent. Thich Nhat Hanh has become a well-known teacher and speaker about meditation and mindfulness. The story that is often told of him is about how he washes dishes. Here is an excerpt from his book about this. He is the narrator in this passage. In the United States, I have a close friend named Jim Forrest. When I visit him, when I first visited him, he was working with the Catholic Peace Fellowship. Last winter, Jim came to visit. I usually wash the dishes after we finish the evening meal before sitting down and drinking tea with everyone else. One night, Jim asked if he might do the dishes, and I said, go ahead. But if you want to wash the dishes, you must know the way to wash the dishes. Jim replied, come on, you, do, you think I don't know how to wash the dishes? I answered, there are two ways to wash the dishes. The first is to wash the dishes in order to have clean dishes. The second is to wash the dishes in order to wash the dishes. Jim was delighted and said, I choose the second way, to wash the dishes, to wash the dishes. <laughs> From then on, Jim knew how to wash the dishes. If while washing dishes, we think only of the cup of tea that awaits us, thus hurrying to get the dishes out of the way as if they were a nuisance, then we are not washing the dishes to wash the dishes. What's more, we are not alive during that time when we are washing the dishes. In fact, we are completely incapable of realizing the miracle of life while standing at the sink. If we can't wash the dishes, chances are we won't be able to drink our tea either. While drinking the cup of tea, we will only be thinking of other things, barely aware of the cup in our hands. Thus, we are sucked away into the future and we are incapable of actually living one minute of life. I mismatch socks because I do not match the socks in order to match the socks. I match the socks in order to get the laundry done quickly. It is a remarkable and enlivening experience to take some time. Thich Nhat Hanh recommends a whole day each week, but even to take an hour or 10 minutes to be really mindful of everything you are doing and to do what you do for the sake of doing it so that you're fully present, fully alive. When we let the busy brain, the quote, monkey mind, unquote, as Buddhists call it, take over our life, pulling us here and there at lightning speed, we have a hard time focusing on and finishing what we're really doing. And the most important issue with this is that we're not completely alive and present to our lives. We drive and think or imagine all manner of things, but miss the reality of the moment. I had an experience many years ago in Los Angeles. The city is separated from the San Fernando Valley by a mountain range, and there is a freeway that connects the two. It's a very steep grade on the city side and a long, gentler grade on the valley side. I was driving toward the valley one night. The mountains were dark forms on either side, and the lights from the cars on both sides of the freeway especially bright because of it. Suddenly, I entered a different state of awareness, and I promise this was not a drug-related experience. It was like nothing I had experienced before or since. My senses were heightened, and I was aware, truly aware, of the speed of my car and the cars around me. I was highly alert and aware of everything that was going on. It was exhilarating and awful at the same time. The experience made me keenly aware of how mechanically I drive normally, how asleep I am in comparison to that night. And it's probably a good thing. I don't think we could, I could live with that intensity all the time. I know I wouldn't drive very often if I did. Again, years ago, a woman told me this story. She sat down at her desk to do a spiritual exercise she'd read about. She was to write down something that she wanted and why she wanted it. And she was to write it as if it was already there. This was to be an exercise in allowing something to be given to her by the universe. Now the first thing she did when she sat down was to grab a piece of paper to write on and then she reached for a pen. 
On her desk, she had this beautiful pot that her mother had made. And in it, ready to hand, was a very old collection of broken and useless writing implements. There were pens with no ink, an assortment of mechanical pencils with no lead, boxes of the wrong size lead, pencils that weren't sharpened, and some colored pencils in colors too light to read on the page. There were also erasers, too dirty to erase without smudging. So in that moment, she said, I woke up. She was astonished at the pen situation, that it had gone on for so many years and that she had been asleep to it. It was especially shocking to realize that she had moved several times before this and had carefully packed all of this junk and set it up on her desk each time. But what was even more astonishing was the resistance she felt when she decided to fix this. Thoughts and feelings flooded her mind. This is hopeless. I don't deserve an easy life. Life is too hard. And then I can't afford new pens. <laughs> And finally, other people in the house will just take them anyway. I have no control over them. She said it took some time and it was like working the knots out of a shoelace, finding the next place to work and gradually loosening it until it came free. She worked through all of the objections and wrote her statement, which was, I have received working pens in all areas of my house where I wish to write. How often is our life complicated by neglect? We neglect that, we, that which we are asleep to in ourselves. It isn't really an external problem, but an inner one. We think we don't have time to pay attention. We have all the time in the world if we bring ourselves to the time. Thich Nhat Hanh tells the story of a young man married with three children who said that he had discovered a way to have more time. He used to compartmentalize his time, time with each of his kids or time with his wife, and what was left over was his own time to do what he wanted. He stopped seeing time that way. Now he sees his time with each of his kids and his wife as his time. He takes an interest in whatever they do together so that he's fully present with them. He began to feel that he has unlimited time for himself. What is mindfulness? It is a state of mind that is described in various way, ways that all amount to being present in the moment. John Kabat-Zinn describes it as, quote, wise and affectionate attention, unquote. Joanna Field, in a book she wrote called A Life of One's Own, describes it as, quote, wanting nothing but ready for anything, unquote. Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Asking, seeking, knocking are states of openness to spirit, allowing all manner of goodness to enter our lives. Henry David Thoreau wrote these lines that describe being mindfully awake. I hearing get who had but ears, and sight who had but eyes before. I moments lived, who lived but years, and truth discern, who knew but learning's lore. I know that some of you have a meditation practice, which is wonderful, and makes mindfulness much more possible in our daily lives. Perhaps you'd all like to set aside some time to practice being fully present with whatever you plan to do. You might be surprised, as I have been, by what you discover and what new ways of being might await you. May it be so.